So, lung cancer, third most common diagnosed cancer. Breast for female, prostate for male. However, it is the most prevalent for death. So it's the highest of all the cancers. You see 224, about a quarter million diagnosed last year, which is about just short of the, the population of Orlando. And 159,000, just shy of the population of Gainesville that passed from that disease. So imagine once a year, the entire population of Gainesville disappears because of one illness. Cancer of lung and bronchus is more than all the others combined, quite a bit more. And you can see that those, actually those numbers have increased. In 2015, average of 220,000 new cases will be forecasted for this year alone. Not only is it the most prevalent out there for deaths, because of its lethality. You can see here that the survival rate is the lowest for lung cancer. For distant tumors, it's around 15%. You can see where the scale goes down. Highly lethal. Now, so you think we should be looking for a cure for this. Here's a stunning statistic that shows that lung cancer research from the government per disease, per death, is the lowest of all these above. So remember from the slide I just showed you that both breast, prostate, and colon are less than lung, yet look how much we're spending on lung cancer research for the government. Very small amount. We'll talk about that why in a little while. Anatomy. So for a lot of people, even simple anatomy sometimes gets past people. They think their lungs are longer, shorter than they think. For the average individual, it goes about your lung capacity. For the lower part, it goes about your nipple line. We have your diaphragm and then your stomach and your intestines underneath there. You can see by the sort of blue skeletal thing in the center, you have on the left side space for the heart. Even though the heart is, quote, centered in the center of your body, it has a tendency to one of the lobe be, to move a little bit to your left side. That's why you, everyone says your heart's on your left side. There's actually more of it on the left side. On the bottom there, the multicolored diagram shows the several different lobes of your lungs. So when you hear people or medical professionals talk about lungs, they'll talk about right upper, lo or right upper lobe, right middle lobe, and that's all those right there. And for those people who are really good about wanting to know about their lung anatomy, you can go ahead and get a tattoo for one. <laughs> risk factors. So lung cancer has an unusual risk factor because as you add certain risks to it, it really multiplies your risk factor of you getting lung cancer. So low risk if you don't smoke. But if you have asbestos exposure, you've increased your risk by quite a bit. You take asbestos and add cigarette smokes, whole lot more. I mean, you can increase your chances of getting lung cancer by just exposure to certain items. Yes, sir. There's no quantitative. It's a over a period of time, just like cigarettes, over a period of time. So the least amount of exposure, the best. You can see on the bottom here, cancer death by lung cancer, and it has, again, the breast, pancreas, prostate, all the others. There's such a high rate of deaths from lung cancer. Estimated proportion of reason for lung cancer. What do you think the 90% is? Right, smoking. Now, smoking also includes secondhand smoke. Yeah, it's in that category. So if you have family members, I think they say it was 24%. If your spouse smokes and you don't, you have a 24% increased chance of getting lung cancer. 
Those families with children also increases their chance for years of exposure. What do you think number two is? No, tobacco products and all that falls in the same category. Yes, ma'am. We're, we're getting there. We'll, we'll get there. I'll, I'll answer that in about two minutes. <laughs> All right, so here's one that I didn't even know about. Radon. Who even knows what radon is? Okay. For some people who are, who are city workers may know some of the occupational exposures, but for most people, it's at your residence that you're getting your radon exposure. So back in the 80s, that was a big thing. You've heard a lot of commercials about mitigation for radon exposure in your house, and they had radon, all of these testings that were done. I came up from up north, so we had basements, so they were prevalent in basements. Not so much down here, but you have crawl spaces where radon exposure. Occupational exposure, that's asbestos, uranium, all these other occupational stuff that we talked about. And 2% just outside air pollution. So when you have people that say, look, I have lung cancer, but I don't understand why. I've never smoked a single cigarette. The latter portion here is where you can fall under that category. That's why. Risk from, from smoking. You can see on the one side here, all the types of cancers you can contract just from smoking alone. Sir. Not as much because smoke is more of a systemic to go through your body through the like if you talk about tobacco, chewing tobacco, that's mostly relegated to your to your upper upper body, to your jaw and all that. But yeah, so you have all the cancers. These are all the chronic diseases. Not a good thing to be doing. Now, if you're an animal, you can go for it. You got a little smoke bass in the center. But the other point of this is that these are images that are all over that sort of portray smoking as being okay, when it really isn't. Except for the giraffe there, he looks pretty relaxed. I mean, that giraffe, uh, kangaroo. So you have, this is what a, your healthy lung versus a smoker's lung looks like. Okay, healthy lung, you got the family exercising, good look to it. The other side, you have with a smoker lung, discoloration, the black color. You can see by this child here with a cigarette in the mouth, brought me back to when my mother, when I was about that age, would have me start her cigarettes in the car because we didn't have a cigarette lighter. So way back when, there were a lot of advertisements that actually promoted smoking before some of the risks were actually brought out to public. So looked at the big difference. Oddly enough, the, the smoker's lung kind of looks like smoked brisket. There, radon gas. So we talked about it earlier, where is it? Found a lot of residential homes, found in the soil. Radon is actually a radioactive decay part of uranium. It's in the soil, I said. There are kits available where you can test that. About estimated that one in 15 homes have the test kit to check for that particular device. Supposed to be inexpensive. Haven't seen anyone in the market around here that's done that research. But I would say check that out. If it's inexpensive enough, check you know, go to the store, see if you can purchase it, and see what the radon levels are for your house. The incidence of radon exposure, because a lot of people don't even hear it, but how much is it? So in 2013, they estimated that radon exposure caused 21,000 deaths from lung, that caused lung cancer. Compared to some of the other things, like drunk driving, falls in the home, drownings, and home fires, Seems kind of ridiculous, doesn't it? That particular thing that you don't even hear about a lot of times is what's causing more deaths than all those. <coughs> Occupational exposure, like I said earlier, asbestos, uranium, arsenic, are all types of things that some of the people come involved with during their jobs. That's why we've become hypervigilant with occupational safety to make sure you have protective gear inside of all your work areas.
types of lung cancer. There really are just two types of lung cancer, small cell and non-small cell. Small cell is about 15%. It's the most rapidly growing, spreads the quickest, and almost all the smokers have this type. Non-small cell is split into other categories. Adenocarcinoma is about 30%. You have squamous cell is about 30%. You have what's called large cell, eh, about 9%. And 2% was what's called the um, neuroendocrine, and they were pop, the kind of the hormone producing cells inside the area. So a smaller amount, not as, not as prevalent, a little more rare. Mesothelioma, the ones that you see advertisement on TV all the time for lawyers to kind of get your name so they can become part of a class action suit. Part of the asbestos exposure, because asbestos exposure, the link to lung cancer is over long periods of time for the asbestos exposure. So the longer you're exposed to it, the greater chance you are of having this disease. Also very pre prominent if you were in the Navy many years ago for working on the shipyards. So how do you think you, or how can people recognize the signs of lung cancer? Easiest, cough, you got shortness of breath, chest pain, and weight changes. As a note, for most places, for most cancers, you will have a weight change. Screening for lung cancer. Most popular way is through a physical exam, whether you have a history of smoking, they do a sputum test to check your sputum for the tissues, and obviously some of the diagnostic x-rays like CT exams. Low dose computerized tomography, part of what a lot of places now are doing for what's called free lung screening tests. If you are in certain risk groups like smokers, age between 55 and 74, has smoked 30 packs per day for a year, or that sort of calculation, you're at a high risk for lung cancer. So there are a lot of places, including uh, North Florida Regional Medical Center, Shands, provide free lung screening. So you can call, there are a lot of numbers out there you can call and get those tests for free. The reason why you want to do that is because with lung cancer, getting it diagnosed early hugely increases your chance for, for, uh, for survival. Test to diagnose, like I said, the imaging test, you have a chest x-ray, you can have CT scans, PET scans, these are all diagnostic tests. Um, sputum cytology, again, I mentioned about the, you know, measuring some of the tissues, and these biopsies, and there's several ways. You have the needle biopsy, Bronchoscope will actually take a tube down and grab it, and laparoscopically will take like a camera and go right through to get to the tumor, so pull those tissues out. Lung cancer stages. Once they figure out what you have, the pathologist will brought back a report, they'll do what's called a staging. Uh, for small cell, there's only two types of staging, and that's limited and extreme. So. Limit is just on one side, one lung. The other side, if it's extreme, it has both sides. For the other, the non-small cell, you have stages one, two, three, and four. So when you hear someone say, I have stage three cancer, that's what they're talking about, or stage one. In the medical community, they have a staging system. It's called TMN, uh, T being the size of the tumor, M being, or N being the nodes, M being the metastatic stage. So sometimes you'll hear medical professionals say, what, are, you know, what stage do I have? And they'll say, well, you're a 210. And that just means that you know, your tumor size is two centimeters, it's three nodes out, and whether it's metastasized or not metastasized. So you can see here, the prime, well, stage one, the tumor is right there. Small size, pretty, pretty new. With stage two, you move up, you see the tumor has increased in size and has now moved to affected lymph nodes. Still good survivability rate, so it's all in one side. 
Go to stage three. The tumor's gotten quite large, more lymph nodes. And stage four, tumor large, what's called dysmetastases, means the cancer has spread to other parts of the body. Now with cancer, it has a definite place of where it will move to. The most pot or most prevalent is into your brain. So Sometimes when you are treated for lung cancer, they'll do what's called a prophylactic treatment on your head through either radiation or so to kind of eradicate any chance of you having also the brain, brain tumors form up. But it's mostly spine, I mean spine, liver, brain. Ways to get rid of it. Surgery, okay. Obviously the one of the, the top ones. Wedge resection. So if you have a tumor that's small and maybe in a very accessible part, they've only got to do a small part of your lung, cut it out with the tumor. They use a border around it to kind of catch any other microscopic part, but it's a small cut. You got your segmental where, okay, you got a little bit more, so you take part of the larger segment out of your lung, but still leaves a good portion of it left. A lobectomy, you take out an entire lobe. And the most harsh would be a pneumonectomy where they remove a whole portion of your whole, I mean, one lung is actually removed. Chemotherapy. So, chemotherapy is used to kill the cancer drugs, it's systemic system goes through the entire body, it targets the certain cancer cells and kills those tumors. The kind of point that some people will, might want to know that it's also, it's usually done after surgery and then it's done sometimes in conjunction with radiation. There are certain chemo agents that have a radio sensitizer that make the radiation even more effective. Radiation therapy uses high energy, only destroys the, the tumors in its direct path, internal and external. These are the physicians that I work with, all radiation colleges, and they deal with probably about 50% of the patients that have to deal with the cancer. So with radiation, it's very vital, vital that we target the exact area they want to treat because since it has the properties of killing everything in its path, you want to make sure that it's as focused as you can right on that tumor. And they do that by computerized planning. So you can see all these beams here are what a computer program or plans out for a treatment for a patient with radiation. Each one of those beams equates to how the machine uses to go through the um, through your body. They use multiple beams because if you just use like one beam coming straight down, then everything in this path will also be affected. But if this is the target inside the center and you use multiple beams, you kind of spare all these surrounding tissues and actually just concentrate on that center. So the types of external, what's called 3D, sometimes you'll hear 3D, 3D conformal CRT. Um, that's your standard one that's been done for the last 20, 30 years. The new technology, IMRT and IGRT, the IMRT is image guided and intensive, intensified modulated, which means that the now can shape the beam of the radiation to equate to the shape of a tumor where before it was just a box and kind of shaped around some blocks, they are now able to move it around so that it actually fits the shape so you have less radiation to other parts of the body. Stereotactic body, that's where you take small beams and shoot it with a higher dose in a certain area, and then the proton therapy. So it's been used for many years to treat a lot of patients. As you can see, there's a number of 50% of all cancers cases delivered to millions of patients over the years. It's pretty safe. 
HDR brachytherapy, part of the internal radiation. Okay, they take catheters, run it down through your throat, into your lungs, and it ends at the tumor. And then while the catheters are in there, they insert radioactive seeds, keep them in there a short amount of time, bring them back out, and they do that a couple times a week. CyberKnife, um, North Florida Regional Hospital has a CyberKnife. Same thing as the linear accelerators does, the other external, it's an external beam, except that it does about 200 beams, pencil thin. And it has a robotic function so that the machine that actually gives the radiation will move around. It'll do a beam, move, move around, and it'll do about 190 to maybe 250 beams. Proton therapy, one of the newest technology. Um, it has some of the other properties of the external beam, with, it just uses the photon part of the radiation and has different properties for different cancers. Targeted drug therapy. So there are drugs out there that they can use now that will target certain parts and characteristics of the cancer, whether it's stopping their blood supply, stopping the cells where they grow inside the lungs or inside the lung respiratory tract. So they, over years, they develop new types of drugs and medication that specifically targets the type of um, cancer you have. Clinical trials. So there are a myriad of clinical trials out there. Um, they're very good for those patients that maybe have not got a good prognosis or they're giving, or their cancer is either hard to get to, not a candidate for surgery, not a candidate for radiation oncology, but there are tests and studies being done on other treatment models that are, have proven effective in certain trials and that have been opened up for human trials as a secondary chance for you to access treatment for your cancer. Palliative care, that's the care you get during your care, while you're being treated, and afterwards. Um, studies have shown that all the caregivers and all the programs like hospice and stuff that kind of makes you comfortable and relaxed and try to accept some of the things that are going on, support groups, have a healing effect and your, your actual survival years can be increased. So we talk about treatment options. You can see that depending on what you have, as far as non-small cell and small cell, and where you're staged, what are some of your most popular treatment options? Because you wonder when you go to a physician, how do they determine what you're gonna be treated? So as a treatment of surgery, chemo radiation therapy, sometimes you can combine the two. Um, there is a point where, let's say, non-small late Stage three, there really isn't going to be a cure for you, but you can definitely prolong your lifespan. That's all I have. Questions?